should have introduced myself as session chair a bit earlier, but my name is Michelle Fisher. I am a certified analytics professional as well, I've taken the test and uh, validated my skills. And I have worked for a range of, would you like to relax? Like, okay. <laughs> excellent, thank you, merci beaucoup, Sylvie. I think you can take a break here doing fantastic work. Um, I have worked uh, largely as a practitioner in a range of organizations from the size of two to the size of 50 and higher. Uh, first, initially in defense, national defense, over to NATO, been out to Afghanistan, been on to South Africa, worked both for defense and, and industry and government in these environments. So I, have, I just want to share a few war stories and a few observations about, based on my experience in operation research and looking at it from an analytics perspective. First, a little OR war story. Um, back of the envelope is a term that uh, was attributed to this gentleman here, Enrique Fermi, who is an Italian physicist who emigrated to the US and was largely uh, part of the team that built the first atomic bombs. And he was a man that was very good at taking very complex problems and simplifying them and, and getting down to that nugget of the problem. And the classic example was when they did the first test of the atomic bomb, he took a piece of paper and tore it into little piece of pieces and when the blast went past him, he threw those, released those pieces in the air, he measured the distance they traveled and he estimated the yield of the bomb. So back of the envelope, appropriate to the task. When I started my career in operations research, I was brought into a defense space, and, and this idea of back of the envelope, a classic, really sophisticated solution was something that was really prized in that environment. But yes, we also needed to build our big models and deal with the complexity uh, in a very sophisticated way as well. But we've heard more than once in this meeting that Albert Einstein quoted, as simple as necessary and no simpler. So yes, plenary yesterday hit that on the head as well. So, so when we are answering questions, they need to be fit to purpose. When Sylvie's team answers questions, they need to be fit to purpose. When Aaron's analytics communities build their models, they need to be fit to purpose. And our teams need to be able to work in, in this space. Fast forward from that OR world, some more developing to the more recent analytics developments. Uh, this is a good summary, but I'm sure you all know it. This is based on Tom Davenport's Analytics 3.0 talk he gave to the Informs Practice meeting two years ago, where he pointed out, well, Analytics 1.0 was primarily focused on business intelligence. 2.0, the big data, dealing with the variety, more quickly, large volumes, to what he proposed, the 3.0 world, where we not only need to deal with all that big data, but we need to have it integrated with more sophisticated models online so that we can come to the big impact. And this is where, in based on my background, I see the two spaces really coming together, the OR and the modeling, the analytics, and, and the the, the needs here, and we've always both been focused on, well, so what? What's the impact to our customers? There's all, not a year goes by where there's not another study that says data scientist, sexy, operations research, fourth best business job this year based on US news. We've talked, Ryerson's pointed out the skills gap, the, the number of people we'll be hiring, so I won't go on any further in this one. Uh, we know there's a need, and we know that there is a unicorn. <laughs> range of skills that we can, we can enumerate a whole range of skills and then we, we recognize that, oh well, nobody has all of these skills. But each organization may want to prioritize those skills based on how they operate or how their teams are structured. Small teams may need to look for a unicorn because they can only invest in one, two, maybe three analysts. Larger teams, we have some flexibility 
and, uh, and we can play a little bit more in that space. There's a very interesting uh, panel discussion at the INFORMS conference uh, that recently took place in Huntington Beach, California. It's on the INFORMS video library and Chevron, IBM, uh, Schneider and other industry practitioners uh, had a good discussion about where do they look for talent, what do they do to develop talent and I, I recommend that you have a look at that too because it also, uh, they were poked to decide where, where, if they had to look for a candidate, which of these would be their top priority and why. Now, given that we are looking for a unicorn, where would we look for this unicorn? Who would you recruit into your operations research team? Would you recruit a mathematician? I would. Would you recruit an operations researcher or analytics team? Oh, okay, an engineer. Okay, excellent. A sociologist. Oh, Aaron, good. Okay, and so forth. Am I missing something from this list? Computer science. There you go. <laughs> Computer science. It's a trick question, and it makes it difficult for us to define who we're looking for and write those job descriptions and where we look. But this, um, I was shown this type of graph at a conference in the UK where there was an organizational scientist who was part of an operations research team and he felt nobody really looked for their skills but they felt he, he felt they really belonged on the teams and he says it's human nature to recruit in your image and of course you will I can do the job therefore somebody who looks like me I can hire them to do the job too and it takes a little I think we know we can look wider. I mean, you saw the hands go up. People are willing to look wider, but we need to develop the skills to look wider because we also tend to structure the job description, the interview around the skills and the knowledge that we already have. Way back, dating myself, when I was hired as an operations researcher, all of those, the cohort I was hired with for national defense are all the boxes that are ticked there. Sociologists, political scientists, geophysicists, nuclear physicists, a whole range of people they thought they had the aptitude and the potential to develop analytical skills. Notably, operations researcher was missing from the list. And anal analytics, well, we weren't even talking about it at that time. But it could be any of them. So given that, where do we look for this talent? You need to look in a range of disciplines at the university. So you need to interact with a lot of different professors, understand a lot of different programs, meet the people and to find out who has the aptitude and the interest to do the type of work we do. Some people say you need to focus on higher degrees because then you get a bit more of a research feel uh, and maybe some uh, practice focused um, programs where there are case studies also allows people to try out their skills before they come into the workplace. My last job in South Africa, I was lazy or pragmatic. Um, I took our young frisky analysts from the different universities and we fortunately had a good range of them and I put each of them responsible for liaison with the university so that they kept in touch with the profs, they kept in touch with the programs that interacted with the students and they kept our organization informed of developments and it created a good mentoring role for them, for the new students too and people like to see young talented people out there it's giving them an image of what career they can, they can develop for themselves in our organization. But um, I think it was Peggy that mentioned it you can't just bring it all in from the bottom up. You can also, if you need a range of skills, you can look within your organization to see, well, who has the domain knowledge and the aptitude to develop analytic skills? And that could be on a permanent basis. I always work somewhere where there are analysts and people that have really fallen in love with it after they did their chemical engineering degree and come into the planning and scheduling team to plan and schedule the operations for the chemical plant. It could be on rotation, you can borrow them for a while, cross-pollinate, or you could do it by project and matrix them onto your team so that you bring that knowledge in on a project-by-project -project basis. 
National Defense did it fairly well. They, they sponsored postgraduate degrees in analytics related areas for military officers who would then spend time back with the teams sharing both their domain knowledge and their recent experience doing a postgraduate degree in analytics. So you get two bangs and you, you grow your skills that way. Now, you've recruited it. How do you develop it? We haven't, haven't found the perfect unicorn. How do I create that unicorn? Or how do I, um, yeah, create the unicorn or keep the unicorn or the talented people that I've recruited? I mean, the work was mentioned, these are interesting, challenging, hands-on to develop those skills uh, initially, and in particular in the first year to two years. And people like to know they're making an impact. And so when I would get a new analyst, I would take them right through a project top to bottom to the point where they're framing it up front under guidance. And briefing the decision maker at the end after having rehearsed, rehearsed it quite a few times with me in advance so that they could see the process from top to bottom but also see that bang you get from doing the so what for the decision maker. And it works quite well. You shouldn't treat them as singletons. They need to feel like they're part of a team, uh, work closely with customers so they really get that understanding of what the needs are and it may not be that first request you get. You may have to tease out the requirements and pair them with a mentor or a coach in the company that doesn't tell them how to do the work, but make sure they understand the context and also guides them with references and ideas so that they can explore within a, a safe area what needs to be done. And then lots of things that Aaron's already mentioned to grow that talent. Um, Informs has a lot of programs, universities have a lot of programs, you're talking about training programs. Uh, we always need to keep people challenged and, and give them opportunities to grow. And this is my hobby horse for this talk. I don't think there really are unicorns, but I think you can create a team. And I would argue it's a zoo, but I don't know there's a movie out there that looks pretty dangerous about the, the animals in the zoo, which brings together different skills into one environment, and it can create, it can tick off all the boxes that you need of your unicorn. And you get an extra benefit of doing that because having these, this range of backgrounds and skills, you, it allows you to tackle more complex problems because you have more tools in your box, more experiences, more knowledge to draw on. And your solutions, especially when you challenge it with peer review by the different perspectives, become more robust by definition. It allows those new analysts and mature people to learn from each other. The quants and the qualitative people, your surveys plus your hard data. You can allow people to develop specialization in certain techniques and skills and then the rest of the team can draw on them, like your reach back capability that you offer at the NCIA. And you can also bring in, you have some capacity to bring in subject matter experts or domain experts that can advise the team. This combination can also create analytics awareness in the company because then by result, the domain experts learn about what analytics is and they take that knowledge back and share it with the wider company. And then the soft skills, I didn't mention it here, but I'm sure most of you have been on teams where you've got the absolute best analyst, but he prefers to be in a room with the door closed and you just shove pizza under it, the door and, and out pops a model a month later. Well, that's fantastic but you need then to team them with somebody who can do the scoping, the communication, the definition, and frame the problem, and then shove it under the door and wait for the model, the model to come out. That's an extreme example, but we, do, we did a team building exercise with one of my teams, and the facilitators were so shocked, we did brain mapping. And where people were, they, they had never seen a team so focused on the analytical space over here and not on the people space down here. They didn't know how to group us for the facilitation exercises because we were so spent that way. Very few people interested in the communication side of things. 
So, so you need to be aware of that within your team and try to try to build um, a synergy around that. And then we mentioned international a couple times. Um, cultural understanding is important. We often forget it because we're operating in a high tempo or a high decision environment, but we need to be aware of the corporate culture we're working within, uh, the geography where we're working. The Netherlands is quite different for a work environment than South Africa. The Netherlands is rule-based, South Africa is suggestion-based. And you need to know <laughs> which of those suggestions are hard and fast and which ones actually were uh, an open door to do more. And then the intergenerational, I think somebody mentioned it with customers, uh, if, if you're talking about cell phone apps and I'm a dinosaur and I don't understand what that customer is going to want, it's sure nice to have some young frisky people on the team that are able to interpret it and play that role to coordinate with the Janet A's and so forth. talked about having analytics champions. It is a huge advantage to a team to have a senior analytics champion. There are some companies now that have chief analytics officers or an executive that understands analytics and important influence that it plays. When that happens, and it's, it, it doesn't always happen, that, that helps ensure that the work is high priority, high impact, and high visibility. Can we grow these champions? Yes. Can a course do it? I'm not sure, but awareness can be created. My experience is the best champions I've had are people that have, at earlier in their career, been exposed to the benefit of analysis and analytics. And they come back when they're decision makers later on looking for it because they know they need it and they know the benefit. So the more good work we can do with customers and stakeholders, all the way through our, our, our projects, the better the chance is that we will uh, eventually have a sustainable analytics champion for our work. A quick comment on placement. If you have that analytics champion right at the top, then okay, the best place for the OR team is, is with your champion, but that does, can separate you from your customers if you're also doing tactical and operational level work. So you need to think, you need to balance those two things out. Um, if you are largely an auditing looking in organization, then you need to be independent and maybe centrally, centrally located. If you're completely focused on support to individual customers or operations in Afghanistan, then you need to footprint forward with them. My personal preference is for a hub organization because you, you can have a forward footprint learning the knowledge, you can have corporate memory and reach back capability at the back, and you can put in structures in place that allow career development, growth, training, etc. The more you push down to the smaller teams forward, the more unicorns you're going to need because they're each going to have to provide the full pack. <clears throat> there are hybrids of this, and there's a very good paper by Accenture on um, the various structures you can look at um, for organizing your analytics teams, and Jeannie Harris and her team put it together probably about five years ago. But it's quite a good summary of the various options and the advantages and disadvantages. No matter how you're structured, I advocate, and I strongly um, advocate, that you bring together all those analytics people within your organization so that you can coordinate, you can discuss, you can sh share your work. Um, we were going to have a speaker from Ford here today, but their internal analytics uh, symposium is this week at Ford. They're bringing together all of the teams in the different organizations, be it finance, be it marketing, to one group, and they share the work they're doing. And that also allows you to um, plan and identify and prioritize gaps in your work. They did this in South Africa to help um, develop our technology development for the team. 
So we bring together all the team leads in, in our petrochemical company in South Africa, as well as the specialists, and we would review the annual program of work and we'd identify areas where we would like to work but we couldn't. And it could be because we didn't have people with the right skills, we didn't have the time, or we didn't have the technology and the software the capability to do it. So we would put in an, an annual plan in place to we wanted to do it internally, figure out how to address those needs. If that was too difficult, we would set up university collaborations and uh, let the universities work on the problems, hire consultancy, and if we had a longer term focus, we would actually put scholarships in place so that um, students coming down the pipeline five years down the road would actually bring the talent and the skills to the organization to be able to address the capability gap. That actually got put on our scorecard, talk about business intelligence. <laughs> and then we had to regularly review and provide feedback on how well we were doing at addressing those gaps. So my tips. Share. Share what you're doing within your organization, without your organization. Create this cross-pollination, create this zoo of analytics professionals so that your team can be stronger within your com company and that as a community we can be stronger. Set the bar high and challenge people to tackle new problems. And customer funding aside, I try, try to tease them into um, saying, no, that is a really cool problem. Uh, I highly recommend using competitions to inspire your teams. The course has a practice competition which uh, values operations research or analytics which is being used on practical problems. And uh, I was very privileged to be uh, on an Edelman competition team uh, when I was with Sassel and that took a lot of time, I have to tell you, but it made our work so much more solid because we had the international peer review and then it had the added benefit of raising the visibility of the team, not only in the international community, but back home within the company. And that recognition, always important to do internally, but also if you, if you let that message get out there, then senior managers and other people will know the value that your team is bringing to the company. So, so let people know if you help on a return on investment. Let people know what the good, cool things that your modelers are doing, what they're doing out in the international community. And finally, inspire. Um, inspire people to do good things. Try to get a bit of freedom for your team so that they can, they can find some very cool things to do as well. There's some nice um, pro bono opportunities to, to test out skills or in South Africa corporate social investment. We had one of our analysts helping build uh, models for schools in the local communities that would increase the capacity of the teachers and the principals, a system dynamics model to help them decide where to focus their resources. Yeah, it didn't impact the company's bottom line, but it sure built us a lot of good uh, will within the community. And created a pretty enthusiastic analyst that wanted to stay with the team. So, in conclusion, build a community and do good work. And that will create a team where people will be attracted to and will want to be a part of. And that concludes my talk. Does anybody have any questions for me? say that actually I, I fully support I've been through the Lindy now taking on it's been only a year since I've been in charge of that team but I think all the points you raised especially at the end they are very important uh, you, do, you do realize if you want to get the team uh, in Richard's eyes you do need to pay attention to all of these points it's not always easy to no. buy them yeah. there's some challenges and constraints but it is definitely I think yeah. you hit very good points there yeah, I think that's the most difficult question, so how? And, yeah. and there are some very difficult implementation challenges, and managing the complexity of a diverse team is not easy. Yes. Going to managing the complexity of that diverse team, so you talked a lot about finding these unicorns. 
building these unicorns. Now, how about maintaining those unicorns? Yeah. How do you do the current team? How do you incentivize them to stick around? What are some of the things that you found uh, are uh, most good, useful? Well, good work, good challenging work that they get rewarded for when they've done it well. I mean, that, that's what unicorns like in my in my experience. And your experience? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's also what our students like. Give them challenging work and that they succeed in. They kind of thrive as well. I find, I find that there's a lot of challenging work out there. There's no shortage of wonderful problems. But there's a shortage of giving them the tools to solve them uh -huh. appropriately. I think that's what we struggle with. Yeah, uh, so tools in terms of software? Or tools in terms of guidance and mentoring and? I'll say software. Software. Yeah. That can be fixed. Can. <laughs> That's right. Put that on your. Uh, yes, sir. As uh, I guess I'm going to say, as one of the old guys, um, just to talk about this whole stream that's been going on over the last three days. The problem isn't any isn't new. We've had this problem for generations. It's, it's different manifestations of the same thing. The solutions aren't really new either. Um, so, you know, I challenge you to look back and see how things were handled in the past. Uh, we've always had new technologies, new silver bullets, new this and new that and that, and lack of, you know, gaps and everything else. So look at that. And the one thing I would say on, on that question is, yes, uh, you know, having been in, in data analytics and always had very challenging things and uh, a certain amount of reward and stuff like that, uh, I think the thing that kills it a lot of times if you're pulling people out of streams that have a career path yeah. and putting them in something that has this challenge but doesn't have a career path. Yeah. That they have to make a choice to move yeah. and a choice to stay because sometimes once they get over here, they can't go back. We have uh, programmers who, okay, they never manage the system development project, so they're limited in terms of their level they can go to. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. It's a, some some people see it as a, a rotational thing. They build the experience, they tick the box. Now I've got my post-grad experience, I've applied it, I'm moving on. That's, you can still benefit from that. Yeah. Other people are making career and you need to build a career path for them. That's, small to, that's difficult to do in a small team. Much easier to do, well, it's easier to do if you have a bigger team, but it's also something that is, can be challenging. Um, Especially if there isn't that awareness at the top of the value of the full stream. You, you get a glass ceiling when you get a, a management level generally. There's, a, there's an upper level. But we're getting past that with this chief analytics officers. There, there is a real opportunity to get to create that whole pipeline. I think another thing that sort of, look at what you've been talking about is kind of interesting, looking at what David just said. One of the other things is that although it's kind of been brought in some of these sort of management training programs these days, but it still doesn't, I don't think it happens terribly much. If I look back over my career, only one manager ever asked me what motivated me. And given the sort of people, you know, you, you've talked about the cluster, you're all up there, rather than sort of spread around. You know, for, you, that team must have been incredibly difficult to manage because, you know, the, the normal sort of managers don't have a clue what's actually making those people tick. Yeah. And to c connect the, the right sort of reward, the right sort of challenge, yeah. means that you need to understand each of your staff really quite well. And so often we talk about all of these sort of things and kind of forget, understand your, per your people. Understand what makes them tick. Because it might not be money, it might not be all sorts of things. And sometimes it's a really quite off the, off the uh, sort of wall sort of thing that really makes them work. But I think it is very important to do in these limited resource environments. It's a great, great observation. Yes, Aisha. Have you seen some turnover in uh, you know, the, these people? Because we keep saying that the skill uh, set uh, shortage is there, and then you know, everybody is looking for those skills. Do you see a lot of turnover of these people moving around to different the environment I was in was fairly stable, mm -hmm. but what we had seen is that there's more demand for the talent being generated. 
and sort of recruiting fewer in, but once people were in, they enjoyed being in the space. Mm -hmm. um, so we weren't losing too many people once they were recruited in, but it was more difficult to recruit in because there was more competition for people being used. Mm -hmm. But maybe the next phase is going to be this turnover issue because, you know, uh, yeah. you know with the people you recruit, they still have, uh, you know, uh, less experience and you give that experience, yeah. they enjoy and all that and either you know direct competitor or in a, from another industry will be pulling this people. Uh, I'll come to Dave about there were one there was one <laughs> comment about a training environment. He said, Well what's the cost of training this person is going to make them more valuable if you don't train them they're just going to leave. So so you have to invest in your people and you hope that, that will make them stay. But I have limited experience. David, did you want to comment on? Well, just within the federal government, so there's like 100 government departments, and as they're starting to, more and more people, the demand is getting there, mm -hmm. uh, we certainly see a lot of people moving, and part of it's because of the new challenge. You know? mm -hmm. Like, I understand this area, and I want to move to that area, and part of it. So, yeah, it's. Um, well, that's a potential a threat, I would say. Uh, say because you know maybe 15 20 years ago software engineering was the same thing and you know yeah. good ones kept moving around and you know times are never became a big problem. Well, I was at the so central imagine in the middle of the project your you know, best two people leave. Yeah. Well, I was at the central agency and I always saw this as a really positive thing because it encouraged people to come in and it encouraged because people to grow within our, and the learn. organization well, that's across fine. organizations. Yeah. But, and then we'd lose people to the private sector as well. Mm -hmm. and, but it was always positive because it's right. it's building up the, the capability. That knowledge body yeah. of the wider communities. You're in it for the long term. It makes time. it easier to get people even though they're at higher, in higher demand. Yeah. That, that's well, a challenge that we're facing uh, yeah. in the environment of men because yeah. people are forced out anyway, let alone yeah. them wanting to go. They are forced out. And so you, you have this challenge of always building up. People. There's benefits to it because yeah. people come, you get new people, new techniques they, that they've just learned from university and things. Mm -hmm. So there are benefits, but yes, it is demanding on yeah. always building up that momentum. And, uh, this this aspect of career development and things that that's much more difficult. To you cannot really use that as a good incentive for the staff because uh, you know that a big chunk of most of them will go, uh, not by choice, but they will force. So in my mind's eye, this is a great reason why every every company should be deeply rooted in professional organizations like Informs and Wolfers and Hiders and everything else like that because we'll all be swimming in the same pool, albeit in, in different communities. And when I left the Marine Corps, staying as a reserve, but still participating in Informs, still participating in Wars, helps me see a mentor, you know, new captains and lieutenants who are coming in facing the problem that I faced in the Pentagon, you know, 70 years ago. So that, that will help with the knowledge transfer. Like Inform stands there to be a handful of people. 